Welcome to episode four of It's All Relative. Today we'll be talking about that last year in the Watts' marriage. We will finally talk about the main Nikki in this whole scenario, Chris's mistress. I've been avoiding it kind of for a reason. Today we will get into his meeting of Nikki and how that ended up being a catalyst for everything that was building over the past year of the Watts' marriage. Those of you who are tuning in for the first time, this is a show about true crime. Therefore, we do talk about some disturbing things, or at least things that are could be a trigger for some people. So if you think that might be you, please turn this off and find something else to listen to. And I'm going to kick everything off. I want you guys to try to forget this whole Beauty and the Beast narrative that has been prevalent in the media and from Shanann's family. You've got Chris, who is a people pleaser. He is a book smart, but emotionally naive man who meets a beautiful woman who can sell ice to Eskimos. I know that's a cliche and probably not politically correct. Now, Chris bends over backwards to show her he cares, even going to her colonoscopy. Shanann sees that he's easily influenced and she sets to slowly selling him those are inverted commas, by the way, selling him, on how she wants him to be. She nitpicks him to his family, and when they bring up their concerns, she prods him to, quote unquote, defend her under the guise of being a good husband slash mate, to the point of, finally, estrangement. Claiming health issues, she even goes so far as to move herself and Chris 1,600 miles away to Colorado, where they actually only know just a couple people. Now, when they get to Colorado, they do live with friends for two years. And it's unclear whether these are her friends or his friends. I kind of get the feeling that they're her friends. While their new home is being built, they're building, again, yet another house. She also insists that while he's there, he take college classes in communications because she feels it will help his career as a mechanic. Chris, again, remember, he hates being in the spotlight, but Shanann films him anyway and posts all that online. She goes so far as to pretend to be him in his quote unquote Facebook posts. And she sells a portion of the Thrive Things under his name. So it looks like he's selling it and he's doing the posting. Shanann controls the finances. Chris doesn't even know the passwords to the accounts. He doesn't know how many credit cards they have or how much debt they are in. Yet again, because don't forget that bankruptcy. Chris cannot go to the gym because Shanann feels it's taking time away from the family. So he has to invest in a home gym to get any exercise. If he's not at home, he's at work. And while he's at work, Shanann texts, calls, and FaceTimes him multiple times throughout the day. If he does not respond soon enough, she will continue to try to contact him until she not only gets a response, she gets a reason why he was not available. If she doesn't like the reason, she will try to make him feel guilty about it. Chris has no real friends of his own. He is estranged from his family who lives 1,600 miles away. He cannot put up a picture in his own home without asking her permission. And he cannot be out of contact with his wife for too long without, at minimum, her laying on a guilt trip. That alone, people, would make me nuts. I want you to think about this. If the roles were reversed, and we were talking about Shanann being the quiet one, the one who was asked to move 1,600 miles away from her family, we would be talking about coercive control, gaslighting, and possibly domestic abuse. I want to make it very clear I'm not saying that's what happened, but nobody ever debated the Beauty and the Beast story, that Chris was a monster, that he is a sociopath or a narcissist, and he's done this horrible thing, which he has, by the way, but he's done this horrible thing because of his monstrosity and that Shanann is an innocent angel. I am not saying she deserved this, and of course the girl certainly did not deserve this. But no one ever questioned that narrative. And I think if we look a little deeper into this, there are questions. There are other possibilities. There are other things 
that especially if we want to find out why this really did happen so that it doesn't happen again, they need to be considered. The last year of the Watts Barrage, things were escalating. Neither of them really knew it. And this is because Chris was so self-unaware that he didn't comprehend his own emotions and his own thoughts. And he kept this quid pro quo going, so Shanann was none the wiser. Um, and as a side note, if you can't comprehend how someone can be so blind to a situation or to their own inner workings, you may be actually one of those people. Moving on. Shanann decides to go back to North Carolina to visit family. She says she wants to bring the whole family, Chris and the girls, and she also says she's hoping to see Chris's parents and sister along with her parents and her brother. She wants the girls to know both sides of the family, supposedly. Now Chris, however, says the situation at work is not in a place where he can leave for that long. So they make arrangements so that Shanann and the girls can go ahead and they are gone, going to be gone for five weeks and he will join them for the last week of vacation. For Chris, this is the first time in a very long time that he has been alone. And it is, in many ways, a shock to his system. For Shanann, this is the first time in a very long time, perhaps ever, that Chris has not been securely attached to her apron strings. On Chris's end, he is not only physically alone, but he also realizes that if he ignores Shanann's beck and call, there's no real consequence because she won't be there to face him later in the day. She's gone for five weeks. So he can ignore her. He can turn off his phone and he can have some peace. And that's what he does several times. Shanann accuses him of living the bachelor life and ignoring his family. And frankly, yep, that's what he does. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this is the right way to handle this, but I do understand it. Like I said, Shanann would have driven me nuts. There was no peace with that woman, ever. There was no downtime. And for Chris, he actually didn't realize that a marriage could be anything different than the one he had. So this was a blatant sort of slap in the face, if you will. On Shanann's end, nutgate happens. Before we get into this, I want to adamantly state that allergies, especially food allergies, insect allergies, they can be seriously life-threatening. So I'm not trying to downplay anyone thinking one nut won't hurt to a person with a nut allergy. You don't mess around with that stuff. What actually happened is very murky because everyone involved in this tells a rather different version of the tale. Basically, what we can get is there was a family gathering at the Ronnie and Cindy Watts homestead. Jamie was there with her children. Shanann went with Cece and Bella. There was ice cream involved. One version has it being an ice cream made in a facility that also processes nuts. Now this was given to a cousin to eat. Cece wanted some, but Cindy wouldn't let her have it. The other version has peanut butter ice cream and a bowl of pistachios being plunked down right in front of Cece and the little girl about to dig into the death bomb in front of her. Shanann pulls both girls out of the house, saying she never wants the Watts to have any contact with the girls ever again and traumatizes pretty much everyone. Huh. Things not going Shanann's way with Chris, suddenly a drama with his parents happens to try to force him to quote unquote man up prove his fatherhood, and protect his family, and side with Shanann. Remember my comment last episode about that convenient timing thing? I'm not kidding about this, guys. Here are some of her texts that she sent to Chris about the whole situation. This is from the Discovery documents, and I quote, You should call your dad and tell him you did not appreciate your mom putting your daughter at risk today, nor did you like that she teased our girls. You should also say you don't appreciate her saying they have to learn they can't always get what they want. They are two and four, end quote. That's the perfect time for them to start learning they can't get everything they want. Let me add here a quote from her first husband, Leonard. Shanann's ex-husband was interviewed by Stacy Galbraith, an agent for the CBI 
Her report from the Discovery documents states, and I quote, I asked Leonard about his relationship with Shanann. When their marriage was not going so well, Shanann poured herself into her work, worked a lot and stopped coming home at night. Leonard was unable to get details from her. Shanann would stay gone, but he was never concerned that something happened to her. I asked about Shanann's skills in conflict resolution. Leonard said that he was very interested in marriage counseling and they went to a couple sessions, but it was virtually impossible to engage Shanann in conversation. When she was done, she cut herself off from him. At home, they would be in different rooms and she was always too busy for what Leonard had going on." End quote. Did we mention gaslighting earlier? Do I think that Chris's family probably thought Shanann was exaggerating the allergy? Yeah, they probably did. Do I think that Cindy and Jamie were trying to murder Cece? Nope, sorry, don't believe that for one second. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, and yes, pun intended, enter into the mix, Nicole Kessinger. We actually know very little about Nicole. She worked in the office at Anna Darko. It's suggested that she worked for a subcontractor. And Chris saw her very little because he usually went from home straight into the field but occasionally he had to go to the office and he would chat briefly with her as you do. From her search history, we know that Nicole was attracted to Chris because she looked him up. We also know that she knew he was married and this is important because of her motivation and because she will later claim she didn't know he was married. Shanann being gone, Chris doesn't have to spend all that time at home, so he actually takes the time to go into the office. Nicole flirts, and this time, no Shanann to answer to, Chris flirts back. In his mind, he is already thinking about divorcing Shanann, even though he has actually made no effort to let her know this. Remember people, he is a people pleaser, he does not do conflict. So to Nikki, he says, I'm actually in the process of getting a divorce. And Nikki sees her in. The two of them plan to meet at a park. They hang out on the swings. And bada bing, bada boom, they're having an affair. Now, Nicole is filling some holes in Chris's life that he didn't even truly realize were empty. And this is on top of all of the bad things that he's already kind of seeing in his relationship with, with, with Shanann. Uh, Nikki values his opinion, even if... He often doesn't really care about the outcome. They are both into healthy eating and working out. They both like sports. And Chris is again smacked in the face by a relationship that is not only diametrically opposite to the one he has with his wife, it is one he really didn't even realize he could have in the first place. Both Chris and Nicole insist they never spoke about moving in together, marriage, and especially especially never spoke about getting Shanann out of the way, AKA killing her. Nikki is supposedly a bit freaked out even when she learns that he has a pregnant wife with her, their first son on the way, saying that she, Nikki, has no firsts like that with Chris. Her search history would show that she did look up wedding dresses online, but honestly, lots of women have a wedding dream and it doesn't necessarily mean she and Chris talked about it. When Nicole sees the news after the bodies are found, she goes to the police. She also searches a lot about Amber Fry on the internet. She tells the police about the affair and denies any knowledge of a plan to get rid of Chris's family. She quote unquote breaks down into tears when she talks about the girls. He's so disgusting. I'm so ashamed of him. Why? 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 How? I don't even understand how you could like bring yourself to do that to somebody who's like <laughs> Frankly, the tears weren't all that convincing. If you watch any of the interview videos online, you will understand why. But I don't think she had an actual overt role in the killings. I think she did some suggested selling, but overt, probably not. Rewind a bit to the time when Shanann is in North Carolina. She's spending a lot of time texting him, calling him, FaceTiming him, and not getting a lot of responses. The ones that he does respond to are comments like, I'm so sorry I missed your call, I was exhausted from work, 
Of course, we don't know what he talks about when he actually communicates with her face to face or voice to voice on a phone. All we have are the text messages. But towards the end of this, Shanann is getting really concerned. And she's not only talking to Chris about it, she's talking to all of her girlfriends about it. She's back and forthing with them, texting, calling. They do suggest that he might be having an affair. And Shanann's response basically is that he doesn't have the balls to do that. Now the last week of the trip, Chris flies out to be with his family. And at this point, Shanann's pretty freaked out. She's really worried about her marriage. She's worried about what's going on with Chris. And she's not handling it well. And I can't really blame her. And while they're in North Carolina, Chris refuses to have sex with her. Well, I don't know if he ever actually flat out refuses. He just, when she makes advances, he, you know, rolls over and goes in the other room sort of thing. She has several nights where all she does is text him pretty much all night long and he's sleeping, which she's very upset about. And again, I can't blame her. I think from Chris's perspective, he's trying to process everything. He doesn't know exactly what to say. He doesn't know where his head is at. And that's a very difficult position to be in, especially when you're somebody that can't really understand your own inner workings in the first place. At the end of the trip, they do fly back. Unfortunately, Shanann does have a Lavelle trip to go to in Arizona. Apparently, she doesn't actually want to go but Chris convinces her to go and she takes off for the weekend almost right away after they come back for Lavelle. So Shanann's in Arizona with her Lavelle team. It is not a good weekend for her. She's definitely leaning on all of their shoulders about all the things she's concerned about hoping that she will hear back from Chris. They're noticing she's not eating well. They think she might be dehydrated. They're worried about her. So again, the Wattses are on opposite ends of the spectrum. On coming back from North Carolina, Chris has pretty much made the decision that he's done. In fact, I think he's actually starting to play with the notion of it would be great if Shanann just weren't there anymore. On August 9th, he texts her a picture of a doll covered in a sheet it basically looks like it's in the mortuary. And Shanann's response is, I don't know what to think about this. I think at one point there was an explanation that Cece and or Bella were playing with the doll and it ended up like that. Chris thought it was funny and therefore took a picture and sent it to her. I think he was at that point definitely starting to think about maybe not actually killing her because a lot of times when these thoughts happen, you're not actually gonna go through with it. It's just, it would be great if she just weren't there anymore. On Shanann's side, remember what happened with her ex-husband? How she just sort of gaslighted him and she was done, therefore she wasn't gonna make any different in the marriage? Well, to Shanann's credit, she actually realizes that she might need to put some more effort into it. And she has a little bit of a self-realization about how she's been treating him. In her texts to her friend Addie, and this is out of the discovery documents. She says, I quote, I need to do better with my calendar. I don't block out family time. I fill in family time. He, and that's in brackets Watts, so Chris, said to me last night, it has nothing to do with business though. Now, Addie said she thought this could have been the issue and insisted Shanann make more time for the family. Shanann replied, no, I agree. I think it's itty bitty things. I sometimes can be bitchy and he gets that side of me. I know I tend to make him feel like he isn't able to do things because I have control issues. He said the other night he wishes I just let him hang up a picture. I always have, but he also never calls me out. He never fights me, he just goes with the flow. He and I know I like things done a certain way, but I never thought how it may make him feel as a man. I don't even know if this is what's bothering him. He still hasn't said. I'm praying he wrote me a letter like I asked since he can express himself better in a letter than talking." End quote. And that's one thing we haven't really discussed, but Chris, again, isn't very good at obviously expressing his feelings and thoughts. 
he definitely does better on paper and so he does write a lot of things down a lot of the things about Nikki we have and we know because he's written them down um, it is a little bit of high school like writing notes he sends her song lyrics and that sort of thing so Shanann does end up writing Chris a letter and leaves it for him expressing how she's been feeling and how she hopes that they can get their marriage back on track and she's hoping Chris will write her a letter back to let her know how he's feeling. I do need to throw into the mix here the Thrive products that Chris was using. Over the last year, Chris had really gotten into using all of the Thrive products that Shanann was selling. Thrive had come out with a new patch for weight loss. He was known to wear two of them at one time. He was exercising a lot. He was trying to eat clean. He had lost a ton of weight. Now, if you look online, there are no clinical trials. At least I couldn't find any clinical trials of the Lavelle products. There is no Lavelle does list their ingredients. They have some proprietary ingredients. There is a list of side effects on the Lavelle site. It is not exactly easy to find, but beyond Lavelle's propaganda, there is really not a lot of evidence or a lot of information about these products, about other people's experiences with these products in terms of side effects, in terms of, you know, does it work? Does it not work? There is a little bit out there about whether it's a scam or not, but that's about it. That in and of itself is a little suspicious to me. However, it is what it is. So that being said, I do think it is really important to at least consider you know, put a pin in it and think about what Chris says about that those patches in his prison interview. Yes. Did you feel like a different person wearing those patches? Especially like the the duo, the burn. I, I mean, the, I felt. I mean, like the Apple watches. Like if you look on it, like when it tells you to exercise, that's mm-hmm. I was exercising like all day. Just my heart rate was like up. Oh. Mm-hmm. Just from those patches. Was it full of caffeine or what? Uh, they just have something. They had something. I mean, I mean I'd, I'd, the black label ones, the, the longer black ones, they those had caffeine in them, but it never had that effect. I mean, the duo burn ones, the ones that are more of like the fat loss type, it was, I could, it felt like I was working out all day, even though I wasn't. Oh, were you tired? I mean, I know at some points, I, I mean, even Nikki said that, like, you know, I'd fall asleep on the couch. Oh. on her couch while I was talking to her and then like <laughs> pick back up like I was like I never knew I fell asleep mm. which I don't know if it was like some insomnia thing or what but like I, was, huh. I wasn't sleeping much you had a lot going on then yeah, yeah but that was the only patches I really felt like a real big difference on just because it felt like I felt like I was working out all day mm-hmm. you don't feel like they changed your personality or Anything like that, though, or do you? I don't, I don't really know. I know that I just felt different on those than any other batch. Now, Shanann's trip comes to a close, and she's headed home. There's a problem with the flight, so it's delayed several hours. And by the time she gets home, Chris is supposedly asleep. We see her enter her house on Saratoga Trail via the ring camera on the door, and that is the last bit of information that we all know for sure before the next morning when that desperate 911 call comes from her friend Nicole that we heard in the first episode of this series. What actually comes next is a bit of a mystery because there's what the evidence says and then there's what Chris says and unfortunately Chris was probably in some sort of a fugue state when this happened Those of you that just blew your chicken nuggets out of your mouth, take a step back and breathe. He was also having nightmares in prison. And I think some of those nightmares kind of contributed to his brain filling in the memories of what happened. If you don't think this is possible, I strongly recommend you look into Dr. Kent Keel and his fMRI studies of the human brain and looking into the science of why people do what they do. It's really good. He even says several times when he's talking about that day 
says, I could have stopped any time. I didn't stop. Why didn't I stop? He doesn't know. Chris's first story is the one that he gave at the police station when, before he was arrested. It's the one he admits later he got from Agent Tammy Lee that Shanann killed the girls and then he killed her in retribution and or as a reaction. The second story he tells is the one he tells in his prison interview. And the third story he tells is based on, I will lay this out briefly, a woman who heard his story and felt the calling from God to contact him and write a book and tell his story. The first issue of this book called Letters from Christopher was actually pulled. There was some possible plagiarism in it. She says it was a complete mistake, so they've reissued it. Um, the book is called The Murders of Christopher Watts. It is in serious need of an editor. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not even going to be politic about that. But it is interesting to read because she does she does lay out word for word in typeface and then also reprints copies of the actual letters that they that she received from him from Christopher in prison about what happened to the girls. So based on the evidence I'm not sure everything he says happened, happened. Upon listening to the four and a half hour prison interview, I'm not 100% convinced of all of the things he says about the girls. The evidence does not completely line up with what he says happens with Shanann, basically because there's no, there's no defensive wounds. There's no wounds at all on this woman's body, except a little bit of bruising around her neck where he strangled her. I'm wondering, he does admit completely that he sat on her. I think he was doing it. Of course, all of this is subconscious. The man does not do a lot of things overtly. It's not like he has a complete thought process when it comes to this kind of stuff in his mind. I think he sat on her because he, this was his way of making her listen to him for once. But at the same time, I don't know if she was completely awake because I... There's no defensive wounds at all. And I cannot believe that she wouldn't have struggled. However, if he was sitting on her just right, he says he wasn't sitting on her arms, but then he also doesn't real, he says he doesn't remember it taking that long and it takes, you know, up to five minutes to fully kill somebody via strangulation or, or smothering. And he really doesn't remember it being that long. So um, I think it's possible in addition to the strangulation, he was burking her, look it up, it's a thing. Then there's also what he says that happens to the girls. And I, I, I've been avoiding talking about the girls because I think a lot of what happened to that family is all about Chris's feelings for Shanann. It was a meltdown. He couldn't handle his life anymore. And he got rid of Shanann and the girls were, by extension, a part of her, a part of that life that wasn't working. In those letters that Christopher wrote to Sherilyn Cadle in The Murders of Christopher Watts. He claims he killed the girls first, then went in to talk to Shanann and killed her. And for whatever reason, the girls woke up, woke back up. He says they woke back up. I, he doesn't know how it happened, but they woke back up and they looked like they'd been in the wars. I think he suffered a trauma, whether it's a trauma of his own making or not, can be debated. And when he went into prison, he started having nightmares about the girls coming and visiting him. They're ghosts. And I really think that some of this concept about the girls waking back up and looking like they've been through the wars is him seeing them as ghosts. This comes from that video from his neighbor showing him packing up the truck in the morning. I saw him and he looks like he's walking backwards and you can see, okay, it looks like he's walking backwards and pulling something that's got to be when he drives Shanann's body to the car. And then there's a moment after that where it looks out like he's basically, he's bending down to pick up Bella and I just went, nope, done. I'm done for the day. Nope. I may not be able to do anything for a couple days now. I just, I can't. I need, I need rainbows and a bride braid right now, please. The moral of the story here, I think is far scarier than anything that the media or the psychologists have put forth 
And that is the fact that Chris Watts could have been any of us. I'm not saying he was a normal guy who just snapped, but I think there were a lot of things that led up to him becoming a family annihilator that are happening right now in families across the world. I have heard plenty of people say they hate Chris Watts. I don't hate him. I pity him. I don't really hate anybody, but you know who I would be tempted to hate? Someone who sees in themselves anything we have talked about in these past four episodes and does not make the effort to change those things so that something like this doesn't happen. Because people always think it's not going to happen to them. It happens to other people. And that's how you end up with situations like Chris Watts. In close, I'm going to lead you out with one of the songs that Nicole Kessinger actually sent to Chris. Oddly enough, it's one of the pieces of evidence that a lot of people like to use to point to her involvement in the deaths. It's called Battery by Metallica. And if you look into what the actual meaning of the song is, I think you'll see why it's not quite the slam dunk. Everybody has been saying that it is. So goodbye for now. We'll see you next time on It's All Relative. Mm-hmm.